Hello and welcome to Winescape TV. I am your host, Ditch Oakley, and we are out of the studio. We're very glad to report today, and we are actually with the fantastic vista, the backdrop that is West Sussex. Now I'm here standing in the middle of a field. I'm wearing green wellies. I'm also wearing sunglasses. Now my producer tells me I'm not allowed to wear sunglasses. So quite frankly, off they go. Because apparently the audience likes to see the whites of my eyes. Now before we tell you exactly where you are and why we're here, here's a little message from our great and lovely sponsors at the General Wine Company. For 30 years, the General Wine Company, international wine shippers, has been sourcing brilliant wines and spirits from around the world and delivering them right to your door. Whether you're a wine lover, restaurant, hotel, or having a party or corporate event, the General Wine Company has the experience, highest levels of excellent customer service, and the range to offer you something special, whatever the budget or occasion. www.thegeneralwine.co.uk Welcome back to Winescape TV. Now, I did before the break suggest that we were somewhere in West Sussex, but I didn't tell you exactly where we are, but we are very luckily to be here at the Upperton Vineyards in Tillington, near Petworth, West Sussex. And we are here for a very good reason, because we have with us James Rogers, who is the vineyard manager, all-time good guy and viticulturalist. Um, first thing I'm going to say, hi James, good to see you. Thank you for joining us here on Winescape TV. You are very welcome and privileged. Fantastic indeed. Now, you started um, some time ago, your father, of course, Andy, started by doing a test run with 800 initial vines. It's now grown to 32,000 vines, which is an astonishing achievement in the timescale. Can you please just give us a bit of history about the vineyards and, uh, and talk us through the initial plantings? Um, yeah, well, essentially, these are what we call the first 800 because they were the first 800 vines that we planted. Um, it's also known as the gnarly wood because basically, unlike most pilots, we planted these vines. They haven't gone particularly well, but we still carried on with the whole project anyway. Um, so essentially what we've got is we've got three rows of Pinot Noir Picosa, which is an early ripening Pinot Noir. And then we've got two rows of Rondo, which is a random German red wine variety, and then three rows of Chardonnay, which um, seldom ever get to ripeness for some inexplicable reason. Is there any particular reason that uh, uh, your father Andy, when he sort of was looking for a, a decent spot, chose this particular spot here in Tillington? Well, essentially what happened was we lived only about half a mile away and he's got a landscaping business, which is what funds the money pit that is the vineyard. <laughs> um, and so this farm came up for sale and the person wanted to move and he got it for a good price. So he bought the land and he just rented it out to the farmer. Um, and then one day he decided it was a bit criminal to own this much land and not do anything with it. So it's, he kind of started to look at what he could do with the land and then he decided that as he has a mild alcohol dependency <laughs> and land, maybe the two could come together and the net result would be some sort of economic saving. Fair enough. So either a vineyard or one massive great distillery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Yeah. Now, obviously, it, you also said before, it is, it is clearly a very much a family affair here because I know your two sisters work here as well. Um, but... Uh, Tell me a little bit more about sort of your... I know you're very organic here, or you certainly strive to be as organic as possible. How easy, or should I say, how hard is it to be organic these days? Um, I suppose in some ways it's quite difficult because, generally speaking, everybody will spray what is needed to be sprayed, but erring on the side of caution. Um, and the only time you really know whether you've got the spraying right is when it goes wrong, and then you know you didn't get it right. <laughs> so it takes, it takes a lot of guts really to make the decisions in how you manage the vineyard if you're going to kind of go down a more ecological way of managing so it, it's difficult to go against what other people are doing because there's a safety net of knowing that if everyone does the same thing and everyone gets it wrong everyone is equally punished sure but to get it wrong and you went out on a sort of limb tends to have poor repercussions, especially if you're a vineyard manager or viticultural genius like myself. <laughs> of course, it's good to hear, indeed. I mean, the thing is, I guess also it's very important these days, because I know originally when uh, English, uh, sort of, uh, I guess English uh, viticulturalists and vineyards were uh, certainly in the southeast, very much aiming to create a champagne style to go up against sort of champagnes from France and that kind of sort of the use of the Chardonnay, the Pinot Meunier and the Pinot Noir. Um, but what I'm seeing, and I think hopefully 
we all, I agree, you all would agree, is that uh, now the focus is very much on standing alone, being true to British terroir and to where you are, and actually creating something unique and individual to your particular vineyards. Um, is this something that you're striving towards, of course? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and when you look at what France does well, it really it has varieties that grow in specific regions, and although they're quite militant about it, they use that to make sure the wine that comes out of that region is best, essentially. So, I mean, to me, when you look at sort of Chablis and you look at Sancerre, they're on a very similar sort of growing region, and yet Chardonnay in the Chablis, Sauvignon Blanc in Sancerre, yeah. and it's very specific, but those regions produce some of the best wines. And of course they could grow either one. But to me, instead of looking at Champagne and saying, what could we make specifically? We need to look here and say, well, our wines are going to be different. It's a few hundred miles, but then that can make quite a large amount of difference. So although you're going for similar varieties, similar cultivars, rootstocks, the wine style really can be almost anything you would like, really in the same way that Champagne is. Yeah. It has such a variety of, of different styles and ageing processes. So the whole thing is best viticultural practice, which isn't necessarily what they do in Champagne. It's really our determination of what we feel is best for this area, for our vineyard, and for what we're trying to achieve, which is super superlative wine. Indeed, and as a, as, a, as a genius viticulturalist, as you said yourself, um, I guess that means you can be not so more relaxed in, in what you're producing, but I guess you can almost be a bit more of a maverick in terms of, of what you're producing. You can try different things because you're not trying to necessarily, you know, to, to create a standard. Uh, what do you think makes Upperton stand out? What's different about Upperton and what you're trying to achieve? Well, I think for a start, I mean, this area has specific soil, um, as you move across sort of into Kent, across Sussex into Kent, you get slightly more flintier flavours that come through in the wine. So it will have its, the terroir here is going to have its own specific style. Um, but what we're really trying to do is have the vines work at their best capacity. So for us, not spraying pesticide is not about being a maverick, it's about if we can get the vines to work as they are meant to work, they will produce the best. Not their best wine. ability. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the same with us. I, I view it the same as us on antibiotics. If you really have to have antibiotics, you've got to have them. But if you take them unnecessarily, you wipe out all the good biotics in your body, and then there's an imbalance. So in the same way, pesticides weaken vines. So if you can get away from unnecessary use of pesticides, or using better pesticides, if you do have to use them, the vines will be functioning much better, they'll be stronger, they'll resist disease by themselves to an extent. So it's a case that the way that you manage it, as is true of anywhere in the world, will have a marked impact on things like the acidity and specifically the balance of the acids that come out at the end of harvest. So that's going to have a reasonable effect in the feel of the wine for a start. Um, also, we're trying to build up those flavour compounds, and that's going to happen if a vine is firing properly, it's going to have good flavour compounds. And so we want to have a really have a varietal that is at its best in this climate. So, I mean, we've got Pinot Noir here. It's never going to be like the Pinot Noir in Burgundy. Uh, it's not meant to be like that, it's meant to be in a champagne style. Mm -hmm. um, but we still want those fruit flavours to sort of be the linchpin of our flavour. There's, there's going to be some more tonic yeast sort of characteristics, but we don't want it to be the drive like it is in many champagnes. We want it to reflect um, really the sort of surroundings and the country that we live in. Brilliant. Now, I understand that uh, at this present time, we're sort of nearing sort of the middle of, uh, of March and probably coming on towards the end of March, being the, the 20, 22nd, I believe it is today. Um, there is uh, still uh, a couple of vines that you are, haven't quite finished pruning. Um, and I understand that you're going to give us a little bit of a, a masterclass on pruning, which is great. And I hear you're going to um, get me into the action as well and, uh, and getting me to try and learn how to do a bit of pruning. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I'd like to say it was deliberate that I left them, but actually it's more negligence than anything. 
and I think it would be good for you to get your hands dirty and you know the exercise also in the fresh air is not a bad thing either. So that's why we're here that's what we like to see so we're going to go and uh, find these vines um, and, uh, and start uh, learning this master class on pruning so we'll catch back with you very very shortly. This episode is brought to you by the General Wine Company. Well here we are back in this row of vines with James, um, and he's going to demonstrate to us uh, how to prune this beautiful beast. Now, does this vine have a name, James? Uh, no, I don't want to get too attached to them, because it's fairly barbaric, the pruning setup. So I can understand that. OK, so talk us through how you prune these and how you train them and what's important about the way that you do it. Well, I mean, going backwards, what we have done here is vines have to stay in vigour, so they need to produce essentially enough foliage to ripen the amount of fruit that they will produce. So, so all the time what we're trying to do is that the, the best um, wine will always be made from vines that are in balance. So it means that we're trying to get just enough bunches and just enough leaf area. So essentially the way that we have done it in this year is the vines grew very very vigorously the year before and so we had to actually tie down more of these, which are usually called buds, but are technically nodes. So we have to tie down more nodes onto these canes. And by doing that, essentially what you're doing is you're devigorizing the vine. So say the vine is capable of 10 meters of growth. If you have 20 shoots, they'll be able to grow half a meter each. Obviously, if you only had 10, they'd be able to grow a metre each. So what you're trying to achieve is making sure you end up with the right amount of canopy. So because these were so vigorous, we actually tied down four canes on two separate fruiting wires, which is fairly unusual, occasionally used in New Zealand. Um, but we had to do something, otherwise our vines would end up rubbish. Um, <laughs> And that's why we call them the gnarly wood, because they just get a little bit carried away sometimes. Um, and so this is a rondo, a rondo vine, and is particularly um, virulent. So what we're going to do now is we're going to determine how much it grew um, this or well, last growing season, and that's going to give us the basis on how we're going to prune this vine. And so what Ditch is going to do is he's going to count up every single one of these, and he's going to assign these ones a number of one and these ones a number of half and he's going to count up the total on this vine of how much growth we had last year. Can I borrow a calculator? Right okay then just talk us through this pruning and I'll pull out the ones and the halves. Well so essentially what we have to do is work out how much we're pruning so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, so that's going to be about seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that counting probably didn't make any sense, but we grew roughly 22 shoots. So what it means is when we finish pruning, we want to have left 22 nodes on the canes that we tie down this year. So that's the main consideration. That's what we want to end up with. Now, every year, you want to grow your new cane off of what we call a spur, which is just going to be two short buds. And it wants to be just below this wire here, which is the fruiting wire, the first one. So I'm actually going to look, there's quite a lot of choice, so I'm going to look for my two spurs first. So I'm going to use this one and cut that there. Good job, Ditch. Thank right you, now. I'm there for you. Um, and I will probably use that one there as well to start off with. They're going to be my two spurs. So that will make more sense in a minute. I've got one. I've got one. Well done. Clap, clap. Ah, That's going to be a long segue. I can see that this is, this is a bit gnarly, this one. <laughs> I got it. There it is, in right. one piece. Right. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a cane that I can get 12 buds out of this side to tie down onto here, and 12 buds out of to tie down to there. So I'm going to use this one because it comes from a good place just around the fruiting wire, but it's higher than 
the spur, which is these ones here. So I'm going to use this one first. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to cut it there as nine. So that's going to be something I'm keeping. Ditch, get your hands off it. Don't even think about it. And then I want I'm to pull it off though, because you just sort of, you know, no, you don't want you've to... tempted me now. We need, we need it. <laughs> and then we're going to use this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we can actually get twelve buds out of that one. So we are a few buds short, and they look like good canes. Um, but although we're three buds short, we've also got some nut. Sorry three nodes short, we've also got some nodes on our spurs. So when we include those, it comes out about 22, 23. So that's what we want to achieve. And now we're gonna be fairly drastic and cut away. Take out the big boy. Everything else. Marvellous. And we they were left with the two vines. Right. That's essentially what we want want to achieve. So we have to try and get as much of this off as we can, which I will do at a later date. Um, but we want, this is what we call the head or the crown, and we want that to be quite tight um, and compact because all of these, there's lots of shoots that are gonna come off this and it's gonna produce more of these. And we need to get it into what we call the renewal zone, which is around about there. We wanna control the growth into that area. Um, so essentially, although it seems drastic, there is no way that that vine would have done anything other than grown very slowly and produced green fruit that would never have ripened. So it has to be done like that. So you're um, trying to stress it to concentrate all the work the vine's doing into the fruit? Yeah, only fractionally stress it, more balance it really. So hopefully at this point it will be able to grow enough so that it can ripen the fruit. Um, and what we're looking for is it to ripen it over the whole growing season. Um, the longer the growing season, the more flavour compounds accumulate at the very end of the season. So when grapes ripen very quickly, which is a problem they have in hot countries, you can lose those sort of volatile um, aromas that are so important to wine. Mm. Um, what's going to happen next is essentially, we'll show you this separately perhaps, is we're going to then tie the vines down to here, these two canes normally wrap them around a bit and we'll tie them here and here and probably there and all of these nodes are going to shoot up like that and from there that is where obviously everything's going to happen for the next year. Um, the first 10 nodes inside of a node are already preformed. So vines grow very, very quickly once those, bur those buds burst because all they're essentially doing is adding water and they're almost telescopic. So there's no cell division involved. They grow incredibly quickly because all they're doing is taking in water and they're stretching out. So up onto these top, obviously the top of the canopy here. Yeah, so I mean by flowering, which is normally around Wimbledon tennis season, um, the canopy's up around here. Uh, that's looking brilliant. We'll obviously leave you two to, to tie this off uh, uh, in a second, but uh, I think um, <coughs> if it's okay, we're going to we're going to sort of adopt this vine here. Is that a, p a possibility to adopt it for the next year or so? I mean, I've got a sign. I would love to be able to put up if, if it's okay with you. Yeah, I mean, it's probably dead now, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's your brutal pruning has probably yeah, my, shown. <laughs> my brutal pruning and your pathetic pulling out. That'll be it. Okay, listen, I'm just going to go and get find uh, find something to hammer with and uh, get my sign, and uh, and we'll be back in a second. Well, welcome back, and here we are on the delightful veranda here at Upperton Vineyards uh, with James Rogers, of course, who's just given us a brilliant uh, insight into the vineyards uh, just now. Now, there was a reason uh, that we asked if we could commandeer Martha the Vine, which uh, hopefully will survive the next year um, after James's quite brutal pruning. Uh, but the reason um, we asked you to name it and to give it a bit of a sponsorship from Winescape TV is if we're going to ask if we can sort of follow you um, sort, of a, a sort of a year in the life of uh, Upperton Vineyards for the next year. Is that something you'd be up for? Yes. <laughs> 
I had a feeling he might say that. Do I have a choice? <laughs> um, not particularly, but if you didn't want us here, that's no. fine. But the thing is, I mean, we can come back every uh, every couple of weeks whenever there's a development in Marfa and, of course, the vineyards uh, themselves, um, which would be really, really interesting for our, our international audience. Um, so if that's something that you'd be happy with us to do, that would be great. Absolutely. Better than real work. Marvellous. <laughs> Get us out of the office and out of the studio. <laughs> yeah. um, now, just for this, obviously, sake of our viewers, um, I understand that you are this year uh, launching uh, tours that people can come to. Obviously, the shop, I believe, is open every day. Tell us a bit more about how people can find out a bit more about you, how accessible you are. Yeah, so the, the tours are starting in about a month's time at the end of April. Um, and essentially, because we want people to come up and see these views. I mean, they're incredible, incredible views of the South Downs uh, National Park now. Um, and we've built the viewing platform so that people can properly enjoy um, what's kind of an up-and-coming trend of vineyards in this area. So we're here because we, we want people to come and, and look at the vineyard, but also we're, we're going to start running courses because we feel, I mean, much, much like this, that wine should be educa educational, even be in a comical <laughs> fashion. It's, really, it's important. A lot of people are interested in wine, and so many people just drink wine and don't really give it any consideration and actually they miss so much enjoyment out of what flavors they can pick up where something's come from the individual nature of something so we really want people to come up here and to experience the vineyard as we see it um, there's so much that we could talk about um, with the vineyard especially on the sustainability side and we want people to be able to come up and ask questions really Brilliant. Okay, that sounds fantastic. Now, of course, we're going to be following Martha and the development of said Martha closely over the next 12 months, um, which is for us a very, very exciting thing. And I think, as I say, it's going to be very educational and fun indeed for the viewers. Um, but uh, we, are, we are going to do a review um, of, uh, of the, the current vintage, which is out in the bottles at the moment. But I can say that uh, it genuinely is absolutely delicious. But what we're going to do is we're going to review the next release after we see what Martha's been doing and how she's come on and uh, whatever wonderful fruits that she produces and of course uh, the lovely sparkling wine that comes from that. But from now James I'm going to say thank you very much indeed for your hospitality it has been an absolute pleasure um, and we very much look forward to coming in the next time there's a bit of a development in the vineyard so thank you indeed for having us. Thank you very much Ditch. And we're James of course, behind the camera. And of course, Jay's behind the camera doing a fine job, uh, even with that long protracted intro, having shakily holding. I'm sure it won't be that shaky, we'll be finding out uh, in the edits. Uh, but from this moment on, I'm going to say cheers, James. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, that James, you don't get any of this. Cheers. See you very, very soon on Winescape TV. Thank you.